So, hi guys, welcome to the next episode of the Karate for Change series, discussing the Asian experience within sports and karate. Um, so I'm going to hand over to the guys who we have as our, our guests and just get them to give you a little bit of background on their story and within karate in general. So I'll go shoot over straight to Mina Y. Uh, hi, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me today. Um, so my karate journey starts um, at three years old, but uh, I, my father was a karate sensei. So it was basically like my backyard. And um, it was one of those things where like, oh, you don't have a dojo? Like I just thought everybody had a dojo. So um, just started training, just watching like older kids training and then just kind of jumped in and just really, really loved it. And was like a total psycho, like as a kid, <laughs> just like wanting to like just do karate and just, it just, I just really, really loved it from a kid and I still do. It's um, um, just been a really great experience and a really great journey. And, and part of who I am today um, is just because of that. Uh, so the organization I belong to is Japan Kapero Ryobukai. My father is Kiyoshi Yamazaki. Um, and uh, yeah, so the style of karate that I do is called Shindo Jinenryu. Um, it's not really well known, but uh, historically it is the, it is considered the first Japanese martial art or first Japanese karate style, just because Okinawa was not considered Japan at the time. So what I'm saying now is considered hugely racist because Okinawa is obviously very much part of Japan. So, um, but there's a little bit of a technicality and then like there's, there is that part of history as well. So, um, and our founder was um, Yasuhiro Konishi and um, that's pretty much it. All right. <laughs> Over to George. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for having me. This is a, such an amazing opportunity um, to give my perspective on this whole um, issue here. But um, myself, um, just like Mina, um, I started karate at the age of three. Um, my father um, immigrated from Japan over to Honolulu, Hawaii in 1965. And um, basically a year, a year later in 66 established um, our karate school which is called International Karate Federation. And I started, like I said, when I was three years old and basically have been doing it ever since. Um, my father basically brought me to the dojo when I was a three-year-old kid, kind of had me just follow along and I just fell in love with, you know, just the whole experience. Um, and to this day, um, there's no, you know, plan B. Um, this, this has been my life and this will be my life for the rest of, you know, till I die. Um, and I love, you know, after being retired from competition, um, my next passion is being able to teach, being able to, to inspire others, to motivate my students um, and to follow into my footsteps or, you know, uh, to my teachings. So um, yeah, it's been a, an amazing, amazing experience. Um, I've had a really, really um, nice career as far as, you know, being in competing at a very elite level but now my transition is into my students and just being the best mentor um, that I can be. God, that sounds amazing. It's great to see how, no matter where you are in the world, barbers are so imperative in introducing you to sport and taking you in there. And uh, just even from my experience, it's a case that some people went to church on a Sunday, we went to karate competitions. That's just what my family did, <laughs> whether exactly. you liked it or not. <laughs> um, but we're gonna go over to Mina who is not a Kratika in a sense. She is coming from a different perspective. Hi, so um, I'm, I don't have any karate accolades, no titles, no medals. I'm just a parent of two uh, karate athletes. So we've been in the game for about probably a little bit over 10 years. We belong to the Shorojuku Dojo, which is in Queens, New York. And uh, that's been our second home ever since we started. I had my eldest, Brandon, start at 10, and Aiden started at five. So they've been doing it for the majority of their life. Um, it's, we started it because Brandon was very shy and he was too nice. And being an Asian in New York City, you kind of have to be a little bit tougher to survive. So we started with, um, I like the discipline, and 
being able to stand up for yourself and just the self-esteem and confidence that karate built. And that's kind of led to where they are now. So that's my parental perspective on karate. <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, last but not least, Sakura, who is a good friend of mine who I see traveling or have been traveling for the last couple of years while you've been competing, but definitely one of the faces of uh, USA karate right now. Okay, um, again, thank you for having me. Usually I'm in the background. This is the first time for me being on the panel and I'm really excited to be um, here with all of you guys. Um, with my karate journey, um, I started when I was seven years old. My life growing up was going back and forth between Japan and Hawaii. Um, I started karate at um, St. George School uh, when I was younger and Honestly, while I was going back and forth, karate was what kept me grounded. Um, it was, you know, I was very shy. I didn't have that much confidence in myself. Um, and I was going back and forth in all these places. And I was, you know, just a little bit of a confused kid growing up. But karate was some that one thing that was very consistent in my life. Um, I looked up to, grew up looking up to all the athletes in the dojo at Kotaka Sensei's um, dojo, and everybody was very successful. And I was very fortunate to be able to look up to all those athletes, and um, that's who I strive to be uh, when I was growing up. Um, and obviously, at the time, Olympics was not in the picture. Uh, for me, it was all about just trying to be like them, you know, trying to be like all those athletes who were in there. And of course, world champion was one of my goals, but it was more of, oh, like, I want to be like that person. You know, I want to be like her. I want to be like him. So it really just started off with that. And then it grew into something big. Now I'm very lucky and very honored to say that I'm representing United States um, at the Olympics next year in Tokyo 2021. So that's kind of, you know, the short version of my story, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I mean, it's but, a yeah. good story. It? I mean, you can't <laughs> knock it. It's a great one. And that, one that so many athletes across the world want to hear about. Um, but where you highlight that you've been traveling back and forth between Japan and Hawaii, and George, you mentioned that you had come over, your parents had come over from Japan would you mind just highlighting to me what, what your racial experiences have been within the sport, whether they be negative or positive, what that as a Japan, someone of Japanese descent being in Hawaii and also competing within the US um, and how, how that experience has kind of mapped out for you? Yes. Um, well, in, in Hawaii, there's a huge, uh, roughly, I would say about maybe like 40%, 37, 40% Asians in uh, living in Hawaii. So the overall experience when I grew up, um, you know, from childhood all the way to, to now, um, even within the dojo, even within going to school, outside of school, um, there's a big Asian population. So I've always felt um, at ease or at home, but, the great thing about Hawaii is that it's a really um, kind of like a melting pot of different, different ethnicities. Um, so, you know, maybe from my experience, there hasn't been a lot of racial tension. Um, we all understand each other's cultures and coming from an Asian culture, you learn at a very young age to be very respectful, um, to be humble, to have humility and to treat others, especially your elders, um, with a lot of respect. So we don't like to see, um, we're not taught to see color or anything like that. We're, we're, we're taught, you know, uh, humility, respect, and to honor our elders or, or just in general people. So I grew up with that kind of learning. So it didn't matter who was in our dojo, who was a part of my father's dojo, whether you were, you know, white, Asian, black, um, of other Asian descent, everybody was treated equally because we look at everybody as a student and a person who's willing to learn and somebody who's willing to progress. Um, and my experience has just been great because wherever I've traveled, whether it's through you know national competitions or international competitions, 
um, I've always felt that the most important thing that I can do was represent myself through a technical point of view. It doesn't matter if I went to Europe and I was possibly the minority or to a certain degree, um, I always felt that my technique and my skill would do all the talking. And that's how I was taught from the very beginning that no matter what, do your work, work your butt off, train super hard and let your technique show on the tatami. And it does not matter if the judge is from another country or whatever, let it be shown through your skill and your technique and your passion and your spirit. And then everything else supposedly or let the chips fall where they may. So um, overall, I've had a really great experience. Obviously, you know that, you know, how karate has origin originated, how um, Mina had said from Okinawa to Japan and me being 100% Japanese, that experience has been very great for me. And so I'm, I've been very fortunate. And for Sakura? Um, yeah, kind of the same, I guess, perspective from my end. Um, again, I was traveling back and forth and it, for me, it was more internal, I believe. Um, I, all of my family, everybody is here in Japan. Um, I grew up with Japanese parents um, at the house. I speak Japanese. And again, going back and forth, I also went to school as well. So it like Sensei George said, um, I was very, for me, I was very fortunate to be able to look up to athletes who actually look like me. I didn't even think about race, like being in Hawaii too, I, I felt more like home, even compared to Japan, because of the way I look, the way I speak, how everybody is, you're, you're just you. And there was never a second where I felt like I was different. If anything, I felt more a part of something. Even if you're different, you're good. You know, there, there was just something about growing up in Hawaii, I think, um, that has allowed me to be uh, acceptable with everything, with whether that's your background, how you look like race. Um, in that sense, I was very fortunate. And um, every time that... I go to competitions, like Sensei George said, it was more about my ability to perform in the ring. Um, I didn't think about um, anything else. As long as I trained, as long as I work hard, I wanted everybody to see my karate and said um, more than anything else. So um, yeah, I was, I was very fortunate and that has been my mindset since I was a kid. That is still my mindset right now. Um, I always uh, go into competitions and I just put in my work and just go out there and compete. Uh, so yeah, with more of the internal thing, because I look Japanese, <laughs> my name is Japanese. Um, it's, I had more issues being in Japan actually um, because of the way I look, everybody assumes that I am 100% Japanese, which I am, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not. <laughs> and in Japan, everybody, um, it's hard for people to accept you can be more than one thing. So as a child, um, being super fluent in the language as well and knowing the culture, internally, I had problems identifying myself with being an American or being Japanese. Now it kind of sounds a little crazy, but as, as a kid, I always thought that I needed to be one, this one thing that, that all the Japanese people wanted me to think. That's why being in Hawaii, I was just more free. It was mentally, physically, I felt more like myself. So I, um, yeah. I'm just kind of venting back and forth, but <laughs> no, I think that's I think that's very that that's a really valid point because being a person of Jamaican heritage who lives in the UK in London, I would identify myself as a British Jamaican, and my parent I have so much heritage and I've been brought up in a Jamaican standard because my both my parents are from Jamaica and were born there and came here when they were in, uh, in their early years. Um, 
but then you're always kind of in between because you're you're not really English but like you're also not, not the other right so when you exactly like you're, not, you're, not, you're not Japanese enough you're not American enough and like I completely understand what Sakura is talking about like when you go to Japan and you have to act it's like weird you have to act Japanese or or else you're not and then there's <laughs> not Japanese enough and then but when you're in America you look Asian so you're not really ever American you're always going to be Asian so you're in like so how she like so Sakura is traveling from Japan to Hawaii and that's like metaphorically like what she's feeling on the inside right so you're like never quite Japanese and you're never quite American and you're just like over the Pacific Ocean just kind of hanging out not really sure who you are oh my gosh. And of, all, of, all, of all the places it was Hawaii too you know <laughs> so even more it's like I'm, I, everybody seems so acceptable here and everybody looks like me right then why is it so difficult being in japan where we all still look the same so yeah. Yeah. that was that was the struggle yeah no 100 yeah well, that, but yeah that's def i think that's definitely some for anyone who's a child of a diaspora who's traveled or immigrated from one nation to the other that's the burden in a way that the your ch the children have right as a, if, if you're a parent that's moved from one country to another and um, is your children trying to work out their identity to, for where they are mean enough um from your perspective as, a, a, as an actual parent how do you navigate that with your with your well, kids i've had very similar feelings at sakura growing up my parents are both 100 percent japanese from japan um, my mom used to pack beautiful bento boxes for my lunch and I used to tell her I don't want to bring this because it's weird. I want an American ugly nasty sandwich like everybody else. Um, you know now it's a delicacy and everybody thinks Japanese food is so amazing but back then it was like what's this black stuff? What is seaweed? That's so weird you know. Um, so <laughs> I was an inner city child and it was diverse but you know, there's Chinese Americans, there's Chinese immigrants, there's different types of Latin communities here. There's whites, there's blacks, you know, there's um, Caribbean blacks, you know, it's, it's very mixed. So it was all of us trying to find our way as Americans and as like immigrant children, I, I suppose. So my children's upbringing is very, very different from mine. They are much more, you know, what you would call American, they're more like second, third, fourth generation American as opposed to me being the first generation being born here. So um, I had a lot of like identity struggles that Sakura spoke about earlier as well. I went to Japanese school on Saturdays, every Saturday. I only was allowed to speak Japanese to my parents, you know, and Japanese kids who were here for temporary reasons with their parents' jobs. They dressed and spoke differently and they were very much more immersed in Japanese culture as opposed to me who, you know, I knew that my life was gonna be here. So it was like a struggle in Japanese school, it was kind of the struggle in regular school. And I always went back to Japan for summer or winter holidays. And the neighborhood kids would come by and call me the foreigner, like Gaijin. And I was like, but I'm 100% Japanese. Like, I don't understand what, like, I never belonged, you know, enough anywhere. So that was definitely, you know, a, a struggle. But now as a parent, I feel like it's so much more, I have to instill more of the Asian-ness in them because they are so much more immersed in the American culture and they haven't had to really experience the struggles that myself or my husband has gone through. So it's like a very different perspective, you know, whether it's like food, introducing them to food early on, you know, just understanding my little, little one is four and he doesn't understand why his grandma has an accent and her English is a little bit different, you know, and I have to explain to him, that's not her first language. She speaks two different languages, you know, that's why her English sounds a little bit different, but you only speak one language, you know, and uh, so there's a struggle of trying to raise my kids to understand and accept and love their Asian heritage. And me, when I was growing up, trying to fight my Asian heritage a little bit and trying to be more American. 
So it's a it's a very unique perspective I feel like that I have. Yeah. On that. That's the, that, that's really really interesting. And I think that, like I said before, I think that's something that is very much resonated with so many uh, first or second generation children who've had to navigate their world in a total different environment to where their parents have uh, been brought up. Um, one thing we've kind of seen, so me being British and uh, living my life on Twitter and now through social media because everywhere's in lockdown and we can't go outside a lot of the time. Um, one thing we, that I've noticed particularly that we see here in the UK with regards to US media is that um, from the outside, being a non-American, looking in, is it fair to say that there has been an increase in just the racial discussions, racial issues and from my perspective, overt racism um, to all uh, different uh, people from all over the US. Um, and how th that's kind of like playing out, is that is that quite a fair statement, you think? That's 1000% a fair statement. Okay. I'm in New York City where, you know, we're considered a melting pot where we don't not see colors we see the colors and we accept each other and understand our different cultures and um the area that i live in has been very safe for years you know and just recently there's been an uptick in you know crimes against you know asians just because of the way they look because of you know the the covid pandemic i've never i've experienced that when i was very very young here but for a long time, at least for 20 years, it wasn't an issue at all. And now it's, you know, happening again. Um, it's not just against Asians, but I feel like people are more entitled or emboldened by the current administration to say and feel maybe how they felt all along. Um, and they're not really hiding it anymore. So that's definitely been, yeah, it's, it, that's definitely a fact. Yeah, I um yeah, I definitely think that's a fair statement, but at the same time, I really feel like it's always been like this and yeah, now there's just more outlets for people to say these things out loud and then also I'm not saying it's a great thing, but we are highlighting and talking about this a lot more in different ways. So the discussion comes up and it's much more prevalent to have this discussion with your friends and loved ones and coworkers and and but I just, I know that from my travel in the US, I mean, I'm living in this little bubble of Southern California that's like very liberal and everyone is like, oh, so like aware of like different social issues and whatever. And then you fly to like, I don't want to even say like a state because like, I don't want people to get upset. Yeah, but like, yeah. <laughs> fly to another state, you get off the plane and people just, I cannot tell you that they will just stop and just gawk because there are no Asian people there. And it's, at first I'm, I got off the plane, I was like, oh, I must have something on my face or body. <laughs> no. Like they are just staring because of, because I'm Asian and maybe they've never actually seen an Asian person. And then you go to the seminars and karate people are very, are like very polite, very kind. And um, so everyone's kind of minding their P's and Q's and they don't say things that are like, they don't say things like, oh, you, and they say a racial slur. No, never, they would never do that. But there are certain things that they say that they don't realize are so racist and like have this like total undercurrent of like racism. I mean, everything that they just asked me or said to me is like based on like an, um, an ignorance that, but, but, I used to get really upset by it and used to really hurt me. But when you kind of take a look at the different layers of like why that was said, like, why did they say that? And you kind of peck at like the different layers of where, what, what brought them to this point and what brought us together to have that conversation. It really is to me is just, they just didn't know. And then, okay, but there are people who like really know and they're out on social media, just like blah, 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 just saying all kinds of stuff. But a lot of times when I run into parents or kids or something, it's just like a culture that they just grew up in and it's okay because everyone else is saying these things. And then my, my job, I think as a teacher is to say, or karate teacher, I shouldn't say like, a, not an educator, but like a karate teacher is to kind of like gently just say like, oh, hey, like you should say it like this. I'm Asian, not Oriental. And like, there are little things that we can do um, to kind of, help that 
person. And I used to get really upset and really mad, but now I really try to think of it from a perspective of like education and empathy and and try to get at it from that perspective. I'm, I'm not a very confrontational person. So like coming at them hard is really not, not it's not gonna be good for me. I feel like it's very stressful and, it, and it, it just sucks the energy out of me. But to come from a point of empathy and understanding and being like, hey, like, I think you just didn't understand what you said and just kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. That's sort of been my, that's sort of been like my path, like to get me to where I am today. Yeah. So kind of going back to what Mina had, had um, the first, the first Mina had mentioned that. Um, <laughs> Always you know, second I, I, place, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. Cause Always I was going to say, place. I was <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, Lisa uh, Moore. Okay. Alrighty. <laughs> everybody, everybody stand up. I'm not up standing on up. I'm not standing up. <laughs> I'm not standing up. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, but um sorry. like I truly feel like this uh systemic racism has always been, you know, since the beginning of time, how this country was built. Uh, upon the back on the backs of black people and now it's just because of our, our current president that that so much of these people um feel that, that they're entitled or have the right to express themselves in this way and you know maybe it's previously they felt like you know they have to keep it on the on the down low and keep it on the hush but now you know because of our administration and and basically because of the president, they feel that it's it's okay, or now it's time to kind of rise up and go along this way. And I truly feel that racism, like kind of like what, um, you know, second Mina minute. had said, second Mina had said <laughs> that racism is kind of like part of your culture and, and it's taught, it's taught. Babies and children aren't born racist. And it's the way you go about, and maybe parents are not specifically saying, this is how you should act, or this is what, you know, giving them actual information about how you should do this, but it's the way you interact with your spouse, with your colleagues. And kids are so smart. I, I have two, you know, kids of my own now, five and one. And you notice a lot of times when they will say, they'll say a bad word. And then you're like, oh, where'd you hear that from? And they'll be like, oh, daddy or <laughs> mommy. So kids, kids are so smart. So you don't even have to teach them directly, but the way you talk about other people, the way you, you know, interact, they will pick up on things subconsciously. And that is how this systemic racism, part of it continues and continues. And until you're very aware of your actions and the way you speak and the way you teach and your your principles and your ethics and morals that's how you are going to make a difference or how you're going to make a change in this and if you continue that system where you're you know you're not conscious of what you're doing this is going to continue for another hundred years you know until we take the initiative to really be open-minded and accepting and loving and compassionate um, of other people's cultures, this thing will continue to happen over and over. Is there a change? Yes, I do definitely feel there is a movement and there's a change, um, especially after the occurrence of uh, George Floyd and how you see the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And I personally have, have done things that I've never would have done since this Black Lives Matter movement, where, where it's from talking to my students, um, supporting, uh, uh, black businesses going into the local chapter, Hawaii chapter of the NWO, um, NAACP, joining that group, understanding what's coming out on their feed through Facebook, doing things like that, um, you know, which I would have personally not have probably done. Now I'm doing, trying to educate myself more, trying to be more open-minded and seeing what that perspective is like. And I think that's where you've got it exactly right. It's about hitting it on the head with being open-minded. Everybody's entitled to an opinion and unconscious bias exists right across the world for everybody. And um, 
and that's also based and that stems from a personal experience as well but like you said it's all about making that decision consciously to go out and learn about other cultures no matter what that culture is no matter where those people come from everybody operates totally different i remember my first time that i went to japan for a business trip and my one of my bosses said to me you have to ensure if you give anyone your business card you give it to them with two fingers <laughs> like this, and, and yes and i was just like of what and he was like, yes that's what you have to that's part of their culture it's like okay great i remember having to trying to give someone a, a tip and how offended that this taxi driver was because i gave him a tip and i couldn't work out what was going on but if I had been less ignorant and more open-minded just to understand more things about the culture, my experience might have been a little bit easier in terms of the people that I interacted with. But that's, that's definitely a great point, George. Brilliant, brilliant point. Thank you. Um, one question I do have is, and this is mainly for Sakura because she's probably the one person who's traveling the most at the moment. Um, have you had any racial negative experiences in your travels? Um for competing? Yes and a no. Um, when I'm traveling, most of my travels are for karate competitions. Um, that It's been that way ever since I was young. And while I'm traveling from place to place, whether that's from traveling from Japan to North America, South America, or Europe, Africa, anywhere I go, it's all based on karate tournaments and travels. Um, and because of that, I tend to be in this mental bubble <laughs> when I travel and <laughs> compete. Um, I believe that there were experiences that I've had um, years ago when I felt like, oh, like they're probably talk speaking to me this way or treating me this way because I'm Asian. But I tend to not think about it too much. I notice it, but there was not a moment where I where I get frustrated or over the top angry. Maybe because it was how I grew up. Maybe because I'm used to um, people treating me a certain way because I'm Asian. And because of my personality, I kind of let it slide, right? Um, I don't like to fight it. I don't like to argue. It's just who I am. <laughs> so it's maybe because of that, um, I didn't really experience a moment where I had to like confront people that, um, I don't know, whatever they said or did made me feel uncomfortable. Um, it wasn't until recent though, when the COVID, pan uh, when the pandemic started happening that I realized that people were treating me different, differently because I was Asian. And it was really recent actually. <laughs> it was um, the Austria Premier League this year. Um, back in March, was it? Mm -hmm. The last one, <laughs> the last yeah. competition. And that was when the pandemic slowly started to happen. And I was denied on getting on the cab like two or three times. And it came from the driver asking me where I came from. So then it was just a back and forth, like, oh, where are you from? And I was screaming USA. I think I was wearing a jacket or I had a backpack, like something that symbolized that I was like an athlete from the US. So, you know, when a taxi driver goes like, oh, where are you from? I just go like US. Um, and then it's like, no, where are you from? I was like, California. <laughs> and then and then I noticed I was like, ah, um, Japan. Right. <laughs> and then, you know, it wasn't. Um, I, I would understand that the taxi driver the fact that he kind of wrapped it up as me being Asian and said, oh no, you can't get on the cab was the most recent experience <laughs> that I've had. I didn't think too much of it. I was at that moment a little bit upset. You know, it wasn't something that I, I was gonna say something, but I just walked away because I was up by myself too <laughs> in Europe. <laughs> Anyways, um, that was the one time I had personal experience um other than that it was more of something that i noticed i went to school in japan um and it was international you know it was a well-known school where we had students um coming over from different parts of the country 
And because I belong to a karate club, karate team, um, we would have students come into the dojo uh, wanting to learn karate. And students with different um, background, um, some, I believe there was one athlete who was black who came and I was like, okay, like, no, like, come, you know, come train with us. Uh, we're open. But I realized that my friends were acting differently because he looked different. So then it was me being more of the outside needing, having to remind them how to speak, like how to approach certain situations because Japanese people technically are not used to seeing people who are not Japanese. So even from being from that side, I was quite surprised and a little upset of how they were acting, but it honestly came from them not knowing. It wasn't them trying to be mean or trying to be disrespectful. I think it was, it came from a situation where they just didn't know what to do. And I had to tell them like, no, you can't act this way. You can't say this. You can't, you know, thank goodness they spoke Japanese. If, if they were to speak English and if I, if he understood what they were saying, <laughs> it wouldn't look pretty at all. <laughs> so yeah, that was, um, my my kind of experience I guess and um, just for the next question that I've got so there is obviously a movement of change taking place I just think even from a global perspective um and I think focusing more specifically with regards to sport and how international sport sport operates domestic sport operates local regional sport operates and um, how would you do you, do, you, do you have any ideas or suggestions on how that change could be facilitated or supported? Um, I know that George has spoken before about, you know, that uh, people in, in general just execute in humility and also to be able to be open to everybody. Um, but, you know, that's something that is a step for every instructor and every coach to be able to do within themselves before they can kind of execute that elsewhere. So any suggestions just as an idea of what, you think might be coming in change around the corner and what there could be in the pipeline potentially yeah um you just you kind of hit it on the spot Nat natalie but um i just think you know everybody for ch for change to happen um everybody likes consistency right change is always brings up this nervous feeling of uneasiness but um during this whole movement um if you're not speaking up, if you're not educating yourself, if you're not taking the time um, to reach out to your students, um, you're doing basically the opposite, and you're not contributing to the to the right side or to the to what is being done, you know. And my from my perspective, it's just like how you said, from a very small level, is just first reaching out to your students. That's how you impact your small community, your small bubble first just by having conversations and asking questions or reaching out to your colleagues and asking them for their opinion. Um, and then from there, you, because you're a mentor, you're a sensei, these children or these students look up to you and that's how you start to affect the bigger community because now they have that nice perspective or that, that open perspective and that from there, how they interact with other people, it starts to spread out. You know, and that's how you can get change starting. So if you want to, you know, you're talking about legislation, all that kind of stuff. I have no, I have no power to do that. But how I can make a difference is the community that I have, the friends that I have, have dialogue, have conversations, talk to my students about my perspective and how I feel and how I do not condone and all of these things. And so that they know that I do not stand up for this racism and that I do not stand for this um, inequality of you know, social justice and stuff. So that way they understand that, wow, my sensei has this point of view and that they appreciate it or they become a little bit more aware. And then from there, they go on and interact with their own you know, friends and so forth. So that's, that's kind of my, my point of view on how we can start 
change. Definitely. I think, um, yeah, George, definitely. I, I think education, 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 and just like reading and, and, and educating yourself. And then also kind of understanding that, like, I think it's great, like, yes, come from a place of humility and kindness and love. Yes. And then also understand that this country was built and that's why it's called systemic racism because it was built on a system where a majority wanted to maintain or not a majority but like there were certain people who wanted to maintain power put themselves in a place of power wanted to maintain it and created a system to oppress another group of people and and that's the part that i think people are kind of missing is that when you say systemic racism i'm, I'm not sure people really truly understand like what that means and so they're like well i'm not racist and, and and but we live in this society where we're just okay with this system that perpetuates oppression so i i went to school at uh, san francisco state university and the best class that i ever took was on a whim just because it fit in my schedule and it was a black studies class and the professor, his name was, I can't remember his last name now, but his first name was Simba. And at one, I thought that was like really cool. But I, I'm from originally from Orange County, which is like very conservative, very Republican. Like, even though we come off as very like liberal, but no, like very, very conservative. Like right now they don't want to wear masks and like, they don't care about other people. That's a generalization. I'm sorry for making that, but that's just how I feel. <laughs> okay, so, so, you know, so you're coming from Orange County, you think like, oh, I live by the beach and I'm so liberal and oh yeah, I'm okay with gay marriage. Like, oh yeah, I'm totally liberal. But then like I go up to San Francisco State, I take this black studies class and like this professor is saying these things to me. And in my head, I'm just constantly arguing with him in my head, everything that he's saying. And I'm just like, no, dude, you're racist. Like you're saying these things, you, white people this and white people that. And I'm like, no man, you're racist. What are you talking about? And then one day, like, I decided to go into the classroom and I can't tell you, I wish I knew why I decided to do this. And I just decided I'm going to go in and like not argue with him in my head and try to find reasons why he's correct. And I just did that in one of the classes. So basically I was not arguing with him. I was just listening to him and it, and it really changed my life because one, I realized, holy moly, Mina, you are super racist. You are racist and you think that like, you wanna be white and you wanna be blonde and you wanna be like, you wanna do all these things and you say these things and you act a certain way, but really truly deep down, like you are racist. And it just changed my whole outlook on, on everything. And it was a really great class. And I like, it really changed just like on the inside of like how I view things. And, and that's why like, I think maybe that's why I'm really always coming from a place of empathy just because like, I, I really just didn't know. And then when I just decided to just listen, like just listen and stop, like just be quiet and just listen. It, it was like, oh, and then I just, and he was saying things that were just one made me very curious about what he was saying. And so it was like, okay, so let's look into that. Like, is he right? Like, okay, let's look into that. And then looking into it and just being like, oh my gosh, like, we're only seeing from one side and we didn't get to see the other side because we're not ready to listen to the other side because change is scary and change is hard. And to have your whole world just like crumble down, luckily I was in my twenties and my world was like this big, but to have your whole world crumble and like, yeah, it's really scary. But if like you maybe just take a little moment like of every day to just listen, like it'll, it'll just, it'll be the change that you're looking for. And that's that's very insightful. That's that's just amazing to hear, and so eloquently put together. <laughs> just, that was such a great. I was just like, this is the number two That's right. Just having like this. Let's go, number one, Mina. And so to be the number one. <laughs> Can I get the number one spot? What are your thoughts on the next generation and? how they are dealing with this and how they're going to navigate this change going forward. That's Which a lot of pressure, pressure right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I personally, you know, going with what 
Mina Yamazaki was speaking Everyone about. Everyone pauses before saying Mina now. Well, I don't want to say, I don't want to say two, so. Number two, number two Mina. The equivalent of Mina. I didn't want to say that. Um, Thank you, appreciate it. Sensei Mina was saying. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I think especially, I've always felt like, I was not racist. I didn't have these um, biases. I thought that I was very educated on on the on the way the world was, and you know, I thought that I knew enough about systemic racism. And with this whole movement of Black Lives Matter happening right now, you know, I've had conversations with my black friends, and I've one of them who's been an angel has said to me, you know, I didn't want to discuss it with you then because I didn't want you to get defensive. I wanted you to understand where I was coming from. And she said, well, now that we're speaking about it, let me explain it to you. And, you know, I didn't know how patient she's been with me all these years or, you know, or maybe that I have said things that were offensive. And she just was always taking a step back and saying, well, I know she's not coming from a place of hate. So let me just let her say her piece and then explain it to her later on, you know, when it's not going to be as divisive or, you know, where I won't be defensive and I would be more open to listening. So this has been a humbling experience for myself as a parent, as, as a person of color. Um, you know, I feel like my father came from Japan and he was always, you know, kind of pushing that model minority propaganda to me and my sister growing up, you know, we work hard, we stay humble, and that's how you get in life, you know, you get ahead in America, this is, you know, the country where dreams come true if you put your work in, and I'm, you know, realizing, you know, that's not necessarily the case. Yes, hard work is always important, but that's not the only thing, you know, and my father wasn't like, super poor and he didn't come from a third world country. He didn't come from nothing, you know? So his perspective was skewed and that skewed my perspective. So as a parent now, you know, with all the different conversations happening, um, you know, I've been trying to be aware of the different perspectives. And as I'm educating myself, you know, and our lack of knowledge of United States history you know, within the school education system, I've been reading up on, you know, how the Japanese were treated here, you know, not just the internment camp situation, but how our lives cross paths with, you know, Black Americans and how there was certain things that were happening where the Black Americans were helping us out or, you know, how the Chinese were kind of, you know, oppressed. You know, it's not just Blacks, it's just, it seems like our history is about oppression and using and not giving credit where it's due. So I've been trying to educate myself on a personal level and then speaking to my boys about that so that they're more aware of, you know, where we stand and what we can do and, you know, reach out to your friends and see how they're feeling about this and kind of gauging how this is affecting all types of people living here, you know, immigrants, American, second generation, fourth generation, we all have a very different perspective on what's going on right now. So I think it's important to like, just keep talking about it, you know? And a lot of the parents that I've met that are full blown Japanese, you know, their kids grew up with my eldest and Brandon and Aiden, um, you know, and I've opened up the discussion with them about, you know, how do you feel about what's going on? And, you know, it got a little heated and, a lot of them didn't understand, you know, the American perspective because it doesn't really affect them. So I said, you know, can you gauge how your kids are feeling about it? Because I'm sure there's like a cultural gap there between you coming from Japan and being a parent and then being like a first or second generation, you know, immigrant child. So we've been having discussions like that. You know, it's been, there are hard topics to discuss, but I feel like it's important to come together you know, and try to understand where the other person's coming from. And then, and like Sensei Mia, like you said earlier, it's, you know, the layers, right? It's like, we all believe that we're good people, you know, especially parents, you believe you're doing the right thing. So it's kind of just trying to scale back and understand why are they saying those things? 
and how can I help them see it a different way so that we can kind of understand each other and move forward. So, you know, that's, I don't own a dojo, I, I'm not a teacher, but I feel like, you know, just talking about it, opening up the discussion, even within our household, you know, I have two boys that are, you know, old enough to understand things. And I discuss things with my four-year-old in a way that he can understand, you know? So it's been like a, a, a learning experience for all of us here. Yeah. yeah I, um, with, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sakura, please. No, no, no. I was just going to agree with what Mina-san just said. I don't think there's ever, this is the time where I was, it really comes from just sitting and listening, right? It comes from just trying to understand and just listening to people. And with this movement, I like myself too, like I started to educate myself in the history and I realized that I didn't know anything. And I feel like as Asian Americans, we have to give a lot of credit to the black community because there's so many things that we can learn and so many things that resonates with us being Asian Americans um, and which is the reason why we have to, you know, stand up for the Black Lives Matter movement as an Asian American. And um, yeah, I'm just like echoing what Mina Sun said, but it's really, and like Mina, Sister George said too, but it really comes from listening to people and educating ourselves. And it's a learning process. Change doesn't happen that quick. It's step by step. And especially with things like this, um, it's not going to be an easy fix, but this is a start. The fact that we're all on this panel right now uh, within our community, with our own karate community and talking about it is a step, right? And I really believe that this itself is a beautiful thing that we are doing, that we're actually discussing about it. We're creating an environment where we're talking about it. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Sister George. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um... You know, since the whole um, George Floyd incident and, you know, Black Lives Matter starting, um, and we've actually had marches um, in Honolulu, in Hawaii. And like to going back to what you had asked Natalie, just like I had two students, one of, which was my niece and one of um, my other, you know, advanced students that actually participated in the march. And for me, I couldn't, have been more proud of them for them to be, you know, just just coming out of high school or kind of like, you know, 22, 23 in that, you know, college age. And just to have um, that feeling that, you know, let's do the right thing and we want to do more. And to take that, to, to, to take that approach um, shows a lot. Um, and I was just so proud of them, you know, they, I was just, I was just like, you know, they didn't go to class, but they chose to do something even more um, powerful and more impactful. And um, I told them that I was so proud of them, you know, um, just to just to have them do that um, shows that people out, out there are willing to, you know, want change and they're understanding what's going on, what are the social issues. And it's really, really nice to see, you know, um, like we had mentioned earlier, Hawaii is, a, you know, kind of a melting pot. So we, we are very accepting of other people's cultures, but even within that, to see, you know, my students to go, to do be a participant in the march is just amazing, you know, and kind of like going back, um, going back a little bit to what Sakura had said about how the Black community has been such an influence in our lives, and you know, I posted something um, on my Facebook and Instagram about how the Black community or Black um, people have influenced me. It, it, you're talking about everything from every aspect about music, entertainment, sports. Um, I put a list, um, you know, basically of my favorite athletes and you know, entertainers, comedians, and all of them are Black. You're talking about Mike Tyson, Carl Lewis, Eddie Murphy. You're talking about Tupac Shakur. You're talking about people who, when I grew up, I was listening to, watching, and so forth. So there's a heavy, heavy influence from the Black community in my life. Even though me being 100% Japanese, living off on an island, there's a huge, huge influence. And I feel that we have to give respect and to give acknowledgement 
and to also like what everybody has been saying to educate ourselves a little bit more and understand where the culture comes from and how these people have influenced our lives for the better you know so um i think a lot of times people are selfish and we take we take we take but we don't acknowledge we don't show the the gratitude or show the, the understanding of where does this come from? Where does this inspiration, where does this um, influence come from? So, you know, it's like what everybody has said on this panel to be, to be able to be open-minded and learn from each other and to have that conversation. That's excellent. Uh, Mina, do you, Mina, why do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, so um, I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, um, Mina and I'm Mina, why? This is what I'm going to stick with. Oh, no. Not one and two. We're not going to do one and two anymore. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I love this. The next generation that's coming up. I, I love how, how they've taken this technology and harnessed it for like, like, like how like K-pop fans took over like a racist hashtag and just obliterated it. Like <laughs> the way these, the way the next generation can do so much from just sitting on their butts. Like, I know we kind of get on them about being like, oh, all you do is play with your phone and then, but like, I love this next generation. I love how um, sensitive they are. And I know that's kind of used against them as well, but they're like, oh, you're, these kids are too sensitive now and they're, they like cry too much or whatever. But like, really like, I just think that they're more in touch with with themselves emotionally, mentally, and, and, and at such a young age to be so involved, like, like George, like your, like your niece, like to be so involved in something and to go March, like, um, is, I think is really incredible. And I think our job is to make sure to have things like this to help kind of guide them in the right direction. Um, but also just to learn from our mistakes, learn from what, what, we've, what have we've done because, you know, Kaepernick was taking a knee from, I don't know for how long he was taking a knee. And that was like his like silent protest kind of thing. And people are now saying like, well, protest, but like protest peacefully. And it's like, nah, man, we've been protesting peacefully. I'm going to say we like, but like we've been protesting peacefully and, and it obviously it has not worked. So let's try something else. And right. So like what Martin Luther King Jr. was fighting for like way back in the seventies is still like, it, like we're still it's still the same thing so like peaceful protests like are we going to just keep beating our heads it's like no peaceful protest is a way for you to feel really comfortable that's what you're comfortable with and that's why you're asking for peaceful protest i mean you don't want anybody to get hurt obviously yeah but let's do something different this time so i just think like this generation this new generation coming up please like 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 look at what we did correctly, look at what we did incorrectly, use technology, like, can we please take back like social media and use it for good and all these algorithms that are out in place, like, can we, can, can the next generation of coders do something so that we're there, like fake news is not something that we talk about or even have to acknowledge in the future. I mean, and, and education, right? But like, I really think it's going in a direction of like technology, these kids who are like so savvy are going to become the next software tycoons and the next tech moguls. And if they come from a place of social justice and like doing the right thing, they could still be millionaires and billionaires, right? But with the humanitarian sort of like, like base. And I think that is like, that I, I am excited for the future. I it's, hard sometimes to think about the future because we're stuck in our homes like because of this pandemic but it's and like all the failures that have come to this point are really opportunities for improvement that's definitely key and i think you, you just hit it on head it's all about the opportunities for improvement and i think that will resonate across the world for all nations all continents all countries and all races um uh, but i'm gonna have to say that we are going to come to a close now but i'd like to just Thank you guys, this was such an amazing conversation. It was brilliant to have you guys participate in the Karate for Change movement. And just thank you so much for sharing your experiences. It's been really insightful for me, all the way from over in London here tonight. Um, it's been brilliant. Uh, thank you all again, I cannot thank you so much. This was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal for me. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you guys. Bye, guys. Thank you. Guys.